Welcome to this Asia Global podcast brought to you by the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. I'm your host, Alejandro Reyes, the Institute's Director of Knowledge Dissemination. In our programs here in Hong Kong and online, and in the content that we produce, we focus on presenting Asian perspectives on global issues. This podcast is part of our Meet the Authors series, where we have a conversation with contributors to Asia Global Online and other publications of the Institute. Our topic in this podcast is climate change, more specifically, the issue of climate security. So joining me now are Rachel Fleischman and Sanang Shidor. Based in Hong Kong, Rachel is a senior fellow for Asia Pacific at the Center for Climate and Security in Washington, DC, where she focuses on the Asia Pacific region. Rachel started her career in national security policy, working in, on um, nuclear arms control at SAIC, the Pentagon, and NATO. Her interest in climate security was sparked during her tenure working for the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security, where Rachel helped to conceive and build the Pentagon's International Environmental Security Program. Sarang is a senior fellow with the Council on Strategic Risks. He's also a senior research analyst at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin and a consultant. His area of focus is geopolitical risk and its intersection with the global energy transition and climate change. Additionally, he also has experience in security studies, international relations, and long range forecasting with a special emphasis on South Asia. So Rachel, Sarang, welcome. Thank you so much, pleasure to be here. Great. Thank you. Now, you know, climate change is not news in Asia. We have storms, floods, extreme weather, less appreciated, however, is how climate affects national and regional security and the need for defense, foreign affairs, and energy policymakers to unite with coordinated systemic responses to prevent the worst outcomes of global warming. Asia's security challenges are broad and diverse, socioeconomic inequities, resource scarcity, instabilities, and national rivalries. They, these are bedeviling governments, particularly in lower and middle income countries that are striving to provide basic services to their people. The COVID-19 pandemic has really undermined many of these efforts over the past year. And as climate change accelerates, its role as a threat multiplier is clear and will increasingly strain and com complicate governance and security challenges. Now, in your article that continues to trend on Asia Global Online, it's entitled Climate Security, a growing military concern that policymakers should heed. You, along with Shiloh Fetzik, of the Center for Climate and Security and the Council on Strategic Risks and Andrea Rezonico of the Council on Strategic Risks, you highlight key findings on the climate security challenges in South and Southeast Asia outlined in two reports by the expert group of the International Military Council on Climate and Security in DC. So, um, I believe Rachel and Sarang, you were the co-authors of the South Asia report and Shiloh, Rachel and Andrea, you co they, they co-authored the uh, one on Southeast Asia. So um, that's a long preamble, but uh, Rachel, um, tell us a bit about uh, the genesis of the report uh, and what is this International Military Council on Climate and Security, um, just to set us up. Sure, and, and thanks for that introduction. It was great. Um, the International Council on, on Military Council on Climate Security was set up in, in February of 2019, so pretty new. Um, in response to concerns from security and military personnel from around the world that climate change is becoming more and more of a, of, of a, a lever, of a spark 
in, in security situations globally, and we needed a space to exchange best practice, share analysis, and push the field forward. Um, so in 2020, the IMCCS launched its first global climate security report. So the first comprehensive report of its kind that's ever been put out. And there's a second one that's in the works now. This is an offshoot of that. So this, these two papers on South and Southeast Asia really try to focus down on what are the particular security dynamics which are being exacerbated by climate change today um, and how our militaries and other agencies throughout the governments and government structures able to respond to them. And are we doing a good enough job at analyzing really what the threat is and holistically systemically responding? Great. Now, climate security. This has uh, uh, been in use for some years now, but I mean, I think in still in some ways a, a, a kind of new concept for many people, certainly for lay people who approach the climate change uh, issue. Um, Sarang, I wonder if you could talk a bit about what you what we, you guys mean by climate security what what, what 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 is this concept and then Rachel maybe you could uh, uh, chime in about after right so thank you for having me out today and such a pleasure to be uh, here with uh, with you and of course Rachel who I've worked with for quite some time now uh, the the concept of climate security is actually not that new, although its emergence and sort of the more popular con consciousness might be a bit, bit more recent. The idea is quite simple, uh, that in that climate change we all know is happening, and climate change is a very serious challenge that affects human lives and livelihoods. Now, for climate security, uh, the, the topic uh, takes that destruction and that suffering and then asks a further question. If you do have such human dislocations and you do have damage and destruction, can it pose a security challenge to regional, national, and indeed international uh, planes? And the answer in short is yes. Uh, we, we already know that climate change impacts at, at the level of human beings. So this concept called human security, which is when human beings are uh, affected in negative ways, that is something people intuitively know. But then that can translate into uh, further levels of uh, instability in wider society, can emerge as a threat to states, creating state fragility, as well as uh, magnify existing geopolitical tensions that might exist in the region or indeed indeed the world, depending on which countries are involved. So translating what is a human story of suffering into a political story at the national level and then a geopolitical story is really what climate security tries to uh, analyze. Right. Now, Rachel, uh, your thoughts on, you know, uh, how we should understand this concept and, and also if you, maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about well, what countries are have adopted this approach? They have really uh, said, "Well, we're going to uh, look at this uh, climate through the lens of national security." Um, and indeed, of course, you know, the Biden administration has has uh, President Biden has said that climate change is a national security priority for his administration. Which is refreshing to hear from the office of the president. We've had several secretaries of defense in the U.S. who have who've made that statement, but I think it's it's um, it's finally perhaps because climate change is growing in its in its strength and veracity that the the the, uh, the governance structures are starting to respond. Um, so climate security is, as Sarai mentioned, a threat to human health in terms of storms, damage to housing, infrastructure, destruction of basic systems upon which societies operate. Your water's not working, your, your energy's not working, your, your uh, sewage water treatment's not working. That creates human suffering. Often militaries are called in to respond. This takes them away from their normal day jobs of, of protecting uh, and patrolling and peacekeeping. Um, the, the 
Climate change is a threat amplifier is an important concept. So if where there's existing resource scarcity or, or ethnic tensions, and we'll talk about some examples of this later in South and Southeast Asia, climate change as a destructive force can, can exacerbate those, create more tension. And then it makes it as well very difficult for governments to respond because they've already been crippled by as we said, the pandemic, but then as well by these climate extremes. And finally, climate change is a, is, is a, a threat to the, or a, a key factor for militaries as well, because military installations are cities, right? So they've got buildings, they've got equipment, um, and, and yet they're called upon to operate that equipment and use those buildings in times of severe storms or floods or droughts. When they're, in fact, they're training, we've seen this in the US, training hours are cut because of the extreme weather. Uh, equipment's not always suitable for use during these extreme conditions. Um, and then the, the sort of mission creep of having to use more and more military resources for disaster assistance and humanitarian response um, is something that, that particularly South and Southeast Asian countries are, are getting to grips with. And some of them are very quietly getting good at this, but it's all reactive, it's not proactive. And we'd like to shift the conversation a little bit, particularly in these reports, which look at the nexus between energy and climate security, what we should be doing proactively um, to curb climate impacts, as well as to take a more whole of government approach. Um, so to answer the last part of your question, what, what countries are, are doing this? I think the NATO countries are, are certainly rising to this challenge. This current NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, um, has made this a priority. Um, the US military has been looking at this for years and we've had congressional hearings on it. Um, Canadians, the French, in terms of who's operating here in our region, the Australians uh, in Asia Pacific have, depending on the, the sort of the political discourse of the day, been either talking about or preparing for uh, and dealing with issues like climate migrants, uh, military response to in, the, in the, the severe fires, uh, wildfires last year, as well as floods. There have been floods and wildfires in the same districts in Australia. Um, and there's a lot of collaboration in the region amongst regional players like ASEAN and also between the US and its allies in Asia on humanitarian assistance disaster response. So it's been sort of quietly growing an understanding of the threat that was the natural disaster piece, but I think a much more holistic approach um, where you have intelligence analysis and proactive action has been missing to date. Great. Now, um, Sarang, you use the term human security, right? which really was in vogue, I suppose. Um, I, I don't know, want to date all of us, but I mean, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe 20, 25 years ago, I guess, or, or something like that. I mean, I, I actually taught a course on human security here at Hong Kong U, um, but it was, uh, you know, in some ways, I guess, fell out of fashion in the sense that there was, uh, I guess, a, a gap in the ability of people to bring together the human part and the security part because the human part, it's all soft stuff, uh, you know, the environment, uh, labor conditions, um, inequality, poverty, all a, a lot of uh, things that people don't associate normally or people weren't associating normally with, when they hear the word security, they think of, you know, hard military hardware and all that stuff, you know. Uh, uh, preserving the peace and 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 trying to address conflicts. Uh, uh, this is the hard stuff versus the soft stuff, and and neither the twain shall meet. And 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 so um, I guess in some ways human security uh, fell a bit out of vogue. Now, do you think that bringing climate and security together as a concept? The, 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 do you see it a, a, a challenge at this point? A similar kind of challenge trying to get people to reconcile, if I could use that word, this kind of soft side with the hard side and, and convince people indeed that, uh, policymakers in particular, that this is the way to go. Right, so I think you're quite right in that there is some apparent disconnect between the two, but actually this is not just a climate specific debate. If you remember the AIDS crisis in the first decade of the century, there was a fairly vigorous debate in sort of policy and certainly in academic circles whether to consider AIDS uh, in Africa and elsewhere as a security crisis, whether to securitize 
the AIDS crisis. And indeed, that the, the meta question there is, can we securitize health as a, a global health as a question? And now with the pandemic, uh, I think we have realized that uh, clearly the pandemic, I mean, it's the most is the most visible symbol of that just because it's happening in such a time compressed uh, manner and before our eyes that it is indeed weakening states it is causing uh, serious erosion of state capacity it is creating a churn in the international order in terms of us china questions and rivalries indeed not just us china but china is with respect to the other neighbors on the origin of uh, the virus for example the the, the debate around that uh, and internally is also creating uh, serious questions on governance, uh, federal questions of federalism and, and that sort of thing. So, so climate change, if you can take the pandemic as an exemplar of what's happening in a short time frame and apply it to a slightly longer time frame uh, and perhaps a little less attribution because people see enhanced hurricanes and they and they don't automatically think climate change until and unless they uh, are, are shown the data which which is showing very clearly that climate change is magnifying existing uh, you know, natural phenomena so as we understand that better and as we as climate change uh, the impacts of climate change become more uh, severe I believe that this sort of disconnect that in fact, the Twain R meeting increasingly is going to be more obvious. Right. And the current debate as to whether we should securitize climate change is going to look a little quaint down the road. Uh, and not to not to underestimate the challenges posed by this question, because there are indeed some countries in the world in the global south that still are resisting the linkage, and there are some good reasons for it, and we can discuss that a little, little bit later. But uh, but I, I do think that the, that the concept climate security is it has momentum going forward. Well, I would assume that if you're in Australia and you were uh, confronted with uh, the bushfire crisis, and you saw how necessary it was to have the Australian Defence Forces, the military, deployed to deal with the problem, um, you know, it, 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 yeah, the debate would seem rather quaint at this point, uh, even now, right. I, I would hope, but. Uh, Don't politicize in Australia from our Australian friends. Right. They're actually in, this, in the process of setting up a group that's similar to ours um, so that they can get the voices of mostly retired at this point, uh, military personnel and, and security people. Um, able to speak without fear of sort of political re retribution from the current administration. So it's interesting. Um, I just wanted to add that, that our chairwoman, Sherry Goodman, who was the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security in the, the Clinton years, uh, is now chairing the Council on Strategic Risks. She likes to quit. It's not about the climatization of security. It's about the securitization. It's about the it's not about the securitization of climate, but rather uh, about climatizing the military, which, you know, which is a very sort of deliberate process. It's going on, as you can see, and throughout comp companies are having to look at this. What's their climate impact and what's their resilience profile? Banks are doing it. It makes sense that militaries would have to do it as well, especially when it affects your core mission. So it's just it's just really logic and, right. and less about semantics. Interesting. Now, um, Let's focus a bit on South Asia about the particular challenges in that region. Now, you both were the co-authors of the report that we're talking about on South Asia. Uh, I wonder if, uh, you know, Sarang, maybe you could just talk a bit of some of the uh, climate security challenges that you identified in the report. Yeah, sure. So the, the South Asian region is one of the most vulnerable to climate change. I think that's pretty well established that this, the data is there uh, in terms of damage, in terms of exposure, in terms of the number of natural disasters that are occurring and indeed growing with time. And, and most of them can be linked or their, let's say their increased intensity can be linked to, to climate change. And this includes drought, floods, uh, cyclones, sea level rise, practically all of the major uh, phenomena that one one hears uh, 
of in connection with climate change. Now, the security translation of these disasters and these phenomena are working at multiple levels. So at the first level, you of course have what we just mentioned, which is human security, which is that human beings and the, the, South Asia is a region with, with a lot of people. I mean, the total population is about 1.6 or 1.678 billion uh, human beings. Uh, and when these disasters occur, like the floods in Karachi in 2000 and um, in, in Punjab, in Pakistan in 2010, or in Chennai in 2015, or uh, various other types of disasters, then you get literally millions of people affected. Uh, some of these people, uh, because of the damage they suffer, and because their livelihoods are damaged beyond repair, migrate. Uh, they move to other parts of the country, sometimes abroad, but mostly within these countries. And in doing so, if they're from a different ethnicity or indeed if there's competition for jobs in, in the new places that they go to, that can potentially create tensions, that can potentially create, uh, not that the migrants themselves are a, are a security question, but their politicization by certain parties or certain sorts of uh, groups uh, can create tensions internally. And indeed can, can raise questions of, you know, center and federal state tensions. So at one level, migration can translate into, can translate, it doesn't always do so, but can translate into a security challenge. At another level, you can get security challenges because uh, there are existing disputes between some of these countries, such as India and Pakistan, uh, as well as India and China. There's also a, a lower level uh, dispute between India and Bangladesh that indeed can get magnified because climate change is acting in ways that are worsening uh, the situation. And more specifically, climate change is acting in ways that are making the river basins that some of these countries share, large river basins like the Indus, like the Brahmaputra, like uh, the Ganges. Uh, these rivers are becoming more unpredictable in, in terms of their flow rainfall is becoming more extreme in terms of its patterns. Uh, indeed, the overall predictability of these phenomena that, you know, for thousands of years, populations in, in, in these uh, countries that are predominantly, by the way, agricultural. So they, they, they farm for the most part still. And they've relied on these rivers, relied on the rain in ways that's predict predictable largely. And that predictability, that sort of, uh, let's say, evenness, is becoming sharper, becoming more extreme. Uh, and that is causing uh, the existing tensions over river waters to enhance in all of these basins, which means that institutions and indeed governments in these countries, both domestic as well as in the way they deal with their neighbors have to be become more sophisticated. Institutions have to be stronger uh, to preempt some of these challenges uh, because these tensions, for example, India, Pakistan, India and China are pretty significant, pretty severe. Right. Uh, they've been militarized, there's been violence, there have been deaths already on the border. So when this additional factor is added, spurred by climate change, and this can be the, the sort of proverbial uh, last straw, uh, if, if, if countries are not careful and, and regional institutions don't, don't actually get their game up. And in this sense, in South Asia, climate is acting as a, as a security challenge. Interesting. Uh, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm particularly reminded if you think about the India-China conflict, of course, up in the uh, in the Kashmir, the border areas. Um, and then if you juxtapose that with the floods that India has been experiencing because of this melting glaciers up in the same area, then you can see very clearly like the juxtaposition of, of those two events, not necessarily coincidental, uh, but, but I mean, clearly um, it adds, that there is that climate dimension to those border disputes that, that is indisputable, if I can put it that way. Um, right. Right. Now, uh, um, Rachel, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about 
um, Southeast Asia because there's a lot of uh, similarities uh, in terms of the sources of climate security challenge, challenges uh, there. Uh, but uh, Southeast Asia, of course, has its own particular quirks, if I could use that word. Um, but uh, yeah, tell us a bit about Southeast Asia and the climate security challenges there. So, sure, thanks for the question. When we look at Southeast Asia, we're looking at the ASEAN region, um, right. which has been this wonderful growth story over the last 10, 20 years. So the population of 650 million people, high literacy, high human development indices, um, high growth rate would be the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, had it, you know, if it's if it was ranked as a single economy. Um, and the problem is that all the assumptions upon which all that very peaceful and stable development has, has thrived are being agitated by climate impacts on, on a bunch of different levels. Um, so you have the coastal mega cities, you have Bangkok, Jakarta, Manila, um, quickly succumbing to subsidence. They're, they're overdrawing their local water supply and at the same time sea level is rising um, and storm surge can exacerbate that depending on when the storms occur. And if you look at the latest projections that have been corrected for, for some of the old modeling to some of the new, um, massive amounts of each of those three cities is due to be underwater pretty regularly in the next couple of decades, so pretty soon. As you know, uh, Jakarta has already talked about moving its government out of, uh, out of Jakarta and farther inland, but that still leaves the other, what, eight or 10 million people <laughs> um, who need to survive. And that's a lot of the, the economic infrastructure, the population centers, uh, the ports uh, upon which a lot of the trade depends are, are you know, are, are just not really are not well protected. And the government governments are gonna to struggle to make those investments absent uh, really well coordinated plans and respond. Um, another area is uh, the South China Sea, which is a, a really interesting place to watch climate security dynamics. Um, so you've got, if you look at um, a map of the South China Sea with, uh, it, it looks with, with all of the different um, national, um, attributions, it looks like a bit of a, a football coach's play map, right? So you've got the Chinese nine dash line coming down very close to the ASEAN borders. You've got overlapping ASEAN territorial claims and maritime claims. Um, you've got the Chinese building up um, military bases and reclaiming land on previously uninhabited islands and marine features, which is what they're called, um, to be able to base its Coast Guard, which is then projecting military strength and um, taking over parts of the fishing banks that, that international law would recognize as being privy to the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, or Vietnam. Um, and, and with climate change impacting the fish catch, so fish suffering from both overfishing, but also ocean warming and acidification, fish catches are going down, the Chinese trawlers are coming out. There's been militarized gunboat diplomacy on the seas. Um, the, over the course of four months last year, I think the Chinese ejected over 1,100 fishing vessels uh, from the northern part of the, of the South China Sea and took about a dozen of them hostage, including their crews. Um, so Vietnam's been the but of that and therefore been very vocal. Other, other members of ASEAN have been less vocal and this comes into the, the quirky dynamics of, of operating within ASEAN that you alluded to so gently earlier um, of, of having, you know, having to, um, or trying to respond as an alliance to this sort of threat which is, which is perceived and felt differently from the different capitals. Um, and then, and then there's the, the oil, the subsea oil and gas. So as all the countries in the region are trying to lean off of coal to some extent or another, um, the subsea oil and gas, there's been a number of different estimates according to the US government, the, the amount of oil is worth, I think it would run China for two and a half years worth of oil and subsea and 17 and a half years of gas. The Chinese estimates are even higher. Um, and there's been, again, conflict on the open seas about who has the right to, to drill there. Then you have to step back and think about where climate change is right now and the fact that we may hit 1.5 even before 2030 and say, 
Should it actually come out of the sea or should we just leave it there? Does that even make sense um, as a region in terms of what we have to do to curb this emissions? But no one's talking about that yet. So this, this analysis um, really tries to tie together existing security tensions, resource conflict, these dynamics, um, and, and the impact that, that climate change either as um, an instigator of more low carbon energy access or just competition over scarce resources is gonna have on this whole dynamic. Interesting. Uh, you know, I'm struck when I was reading your reports and then also the article on Asia Global Online, that you know, the, really the overlap of these two regions, South Asia and Southeast Asia, because you identify um, the security challenges like um, you know, internal separatist or extremist groups possibly taking advantage of uh, climate problems, uh, geopolitical tensions around, you mentioned India, Pakistan, India, China, and then, uh, you know, and in Southeast Asia, you have a similar thing where, where, where um, there are issues related to violent extremism that may get stoked, if you will, uh, given some um, climate challenges or water challenges, energy challenges, uh, as well as this sort of high stakes competition between ASEAN or certain ASEAN countries and, and China related to this Chow China um, Sea. So um, it, it, it does seem that these two regions are uh, really have uh, a, a fair bit in common. And then Rachel, you, you, you know, you talked about, well, um, in some ways, an, another area is the continuing fossil fuel use and, um, and, and the difficulties or, or perhaps the reluctance of, of some countries to really wean themselves off of, of fossil fuels. Um, I'm wondering if you could um, talk a bit about that, particularly in the context of the climate summit that we just had last week on Earth Day, in which it seemed that at least the United States and other countries like Canada and I think China to some extent uh, were wanting to kind of up the ante with regard to what they committed to in the Paris Climate Agreement. And indeed, of course, the United States now back into uh, the Paris Agreement with the Biden administration. Um, are we seeing in South Asia, Southeast Asia, a similar kind of momentum? I mean, uh, I believe Xi Jinping said that uh, China would reach a peak in fossil fuel use at 2025 and then start sort of petering off uh, from there. And of course, big challenge for China because they really are dependent on coal uh, powered uh, uh, plants. Um, what, what is the picture that you see in terms of the development of renewables, the use of fossil fuels in South Asia? And then Rachel, I'm wondering if you do the same after on Southeast Asia. Sarah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so that, that's quite a few things to address, but yeah, sorry. I, just, <laughs> no, that's, I that's pack fine. it in, I, I don't pack lightly. <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> I, I'll try to pack it in in the answer as much as I can. But uh, I, I guess there, there is this uh, connection between uh, the, the obvious connection between mitigation and, and adaptation and security, by which I mean the urgency of addressing the source of climate change, which is indeed the emissions of greenhouse gases, principally being carbon dioxide. And South Asia, and indeed also much of the rest of Asia, but certainly South Asia is um, quite a major emitter in terms of the overall global picture. So it's about 10% of the overall emissions profile. Uh, and of those countries in South Asia, India is obviously the large, being the largest economy, contributes 7% of the overall profile. But more than the current emissions, it's about the future emissions because all these countries are growing in terms of their GDP and in the future will uh, take up more of the 
net emissions, uh, net annual emissions. Now, we should be mindful, of course, that climate change is caused by cumulative emissions in the atmosphere. So the overall amount of carbon that's sitting in the atmosphere is causing the heating. And if you look at that, then, of course, the wealthier countries like the US or the EU or now even China, uh, Russia and Japan have contributed significantly more than any South Asian country to the mix. Nevertheless, if you're going to solve the problem, we're going to have to have everybody, um, you know, pull this wagon, so to speak. And so the South Asian countries do have a responsibility to cut back on their uh, fossil fuel use. And in the case of India, particularly, coal is a major component of its emissions. And so the pressure has been in the leaders' summit uh, on India to uh, do more. Uh, although India's existing commitments are fairly substantial. So it has a target of 175 gigawatts of renewable energy electricity by 2022, which has been up to 450 gigawatts by 2030 uh, by its government. So uh, there are substantial commitments. There are, of course, questions as to whether India can get to those levels. And indeed, there are other countries that are important in South Asia, such as Pakistan and Bangladesh, which rely more on natural gas than coal. But going forward, even natural gas is going to have to be reduced if we are looking at a 20, uh, even 2030 timeframe, but certainly after 2030. So all of these countries are going to have to start embracing much more of renewable energy and indeed electrify transport and then also electrify or otherwise uh, decarbonize industrial uh, energy emissions. So the challenge is steep um, and the US has set out under, under President Biden a number of um, commitments domestically, but has also pledged to help India in particular. There's an action plan that President Biden has announced with India for a partnership to decarbonize, and that time frame of the partnership is 2030. So there's pledges on finance and pledges on assistance on, on raising more private uh, capital, indeed, to accelerate this renewable energy transition so that we, at the first stage, at least get to a much more green electricity system in India, uh, which has been one of the biggest outcomes of the summit in terms of South Asia. Right. Now, uh, Rachel, and for your part? Sure. Um, so Southeast Asia um, has a mix of, of fossil fuel, mostly fossil fuel um, dependent power and um, some projections toward renewable energy, but it's not happening quickly. I think we need to look at it in the context of a collective action program, a problem where we need both national governments, but then also regional governments and aid donors to be working together um, to make this shift happen. Being Realizing that the, the energy needs in Southeast Asia have grown 80% over the last 20 years are projected to go grow 60% over the next, over the coming 20 years. And some of that really um, can't be avoided. So in, in China, there's a lot of inefficient factories where existing technologies could quickly make a dent in the energy efficiency. It's not as clear in the less industrialized, more agricultural-based economies. Of course, there's ways to improve agricultural use, and particularly water use, which is also very fossil fuel dependent if it's being pumped. Um, but you have to recognize as well that over 500 million people today are at risk of excessive heat in Southeast Asia. And because the air con penetration in Southeast Asia is maybe 20%, but India is 10%, Indonesia is 10%. You get to the point where with the heat and the humidity, there's points at which you just cannot, the human body can't tolerate being outside for more than a couple of hours. And if houses are not air conditioned, then people will simply not be able to live. They will simply, you know, organs will start shutting down. So this, we need electrification so that we can have air conditioning, so we can have productivity, so we can have more efficiency. So we can't slow down the energy growth necessarily, but where that investment is needed is important. So how the power is generated is going to be consequential for both human health and for the environment and climate change and the economies. 80% of the new coal plant today in the world is in Asia, and a lot of it in Southeast Asia is funded by Korea, Japan, and China. Now, I think I saw 
that, that, that the Japanese are going to pull back from funding coal in, I think they made that announcement on right. Thursday, um, which, is, which is fantastic. And I think a number of us have been, have been um, waiting for that to, to make that announcement. Hopefully that will increase pressure on Korea as well. Um, and that, that China will also see um, the benefit of, of deploying its newest technologies when it's it's giving aid. But there's some there's still there's some challenges there. One is the low base from which we start. The second is that the grids of, of, of companies like uh, countries like the Philippines are not set up to accept renewable energy and, and these uh, disaggregated sources of renewable energy and will need to be upgraded. That will take some time. Um, a third, if you if you look at the opportunity for nuclear power, there are no nuclear power playoffs in Southeast Asia right now. Um, there's, some con- there's two kinds of concerns around that that need to be taken into account. Um, one is that whichever country is sponsoring the nuclear technology, uh, be that China or Russia, which look to be the two who are sort of um, interested in providing that technology, once an agreement is signed, um, that cements at least a 30 to 50 year relationship of dependency with that country, which gives that the, the supplier country quite a strong hold uh, from a, a broader foreign policy perspective over um, the recipient country in terms of nuclear technology, maintenance of the, and upgrades of, of, of the equipment. Secondly, most nuclear power plants are situated uh, next to, adjacent to large water bodies or the sea, at least 25% of them are coastal. Um, because of the amount of cooling water that's needed, but as we saw with Fukushima 10 years ago, um, that can also be a, a challenge when there's extreme weather. So while Fukushima was not caused by climate change, um, the subsidence with, and, and the sea level rise that's going on in all of coastal Southeast Asia could potentially be really dangerous from the, from the perspective of having a nuclear power plant or nuclear storage facilities. And so that would have to be really carefully um, designed, monitored, and able to be upgraded if, if, if the advent of climate change is even faster than what we expect. So we have, wouldn't have be designing for today's standards, we should be designing for 2060 or right, later, right. and that hasn't happened yet. So we really have to think through these. And this is where energy policy people and intelligence people and military and security and foreign policy people should all be sitting around the same table having this conversation in order to make the best possible choices. Right. Interesting, and, and, and I have to say, interesting you mentioned the air conditioning issue, of course, because um, if you think about the pandemic and how many folks have had to go and work at home, uh, children have to go to school remotely, um, and indeed the growth of the middle class uh, in Asia is really the fastest uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, the demand for air conditioning really will uh, inevitably increase significantly. And, and you can't stop people from wanting to have cooler air so that they can function and be productive, uh, particularly if everything gets hot. I mean, we're very aware of that here in Hong Kong. Um, uh, <laughs> so, but yeah, and, and, and I think in some ways a, a small thing, small thing, but it really has... Uh, major consequences if we don't think um, more deeply about that particular issue, just you know, people seeking comfort so that they can work, especially post pandemic where we are likely to have more work from home uh, than we've had before. Um, now, I'm wondering if I could just ask you as briefly about your recommendations. Well, going forward, okay, we recognize the challenges in South Asia and, 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 and in South A- Southeast Asia. Well, what really do governments, policymakers need to do? I know one of your recommendations for security actors is to, to create sort of a regional crime security, uh, cl- crime, climate security watch centers uh, to, 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 to be, sort of on top of the, the issue. Uh, what, what are some of the um, recommendations that you outlined in the report? So Sarang first, or South Asia? Well, I think the, the recommendations can be seen at many levels, uh, right? So starting with the geopolitical side, the fact that you have these shared river basins you have a very spotty treaty landscape in terms of how you share the, the waters that we have at the present. 
and overlaid with the fact that the geopolitical tensions are generally worse. Um, I mean, it's in always a cycle and there's an up and down, but in general, the situation is more dangerous now because countries have nuclear weapons, there are more of them, uh, there's more infrastructure building on the border, there's a broader geopolitical US-China rivalry that's being overlaid on top of the existing regional situation. So uh, the situation is more risky and the institutions that exist, which by institutions, I don't just mean organizations. Uh, we also mean uh, things like or agreements uh, where countries understand either in written form or otherwise obey certain practices, have to be strengthened much more. And here we are talking about not only strengthening, strengthening existing treaties like the indus Water Treaty um, to include, for example, China, but also to uh, translate it from just a partition treaty of partitioning borders to something more holistic about managing the overall river system in an integrated fashion, in an environmentally sensitive fashion, but also creation of entirely new institutions, such as between India and China and Bangladesh over the Brahmaputra, that currently there is no treaty that governs that river basin at all. So how do we start by creating that treaty from the ground up, knowing what we know, and we know a lot more now than, let's say, the 50s, when the Indus Water Treaty was designed, uh, is really the challenge, but the question is always is trust. These countries don't trust each other for, you know, from each of their standpoints, good reasons. But here's where the international community and the United States can act as a, a you know, perhaps a more discreet, but a, a good faith um, advisor or enabler. Uh, not mediator, because countries there do not like necessarily mediation by outside powers, but providing the sorts of technical assistance and expertise that the World Bank indeed did, did provide for the Indus Waters Treaty in 1960 uh, can similarly be provided to these countries should they be uh, interested, should they be willing. And I think this is the task of our times. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenging task. It's a longer term task. In the short term, of course, there have to be more of these confidence building measures that help avoid a, a water crisis or a flood from turning into a security crisis. And there are also similar uh, recommendations domestically, because as we said earlier, climate change is also a security risk in the domestic plane. Uh, so domestic institutions, regional institutions, and indeed the international community's involvement in a good faith manner, in a discreet manner, but yet aiding always to stabilize the situation and deepening uh, deepen institutions is, is really what's needed in South Asia. Thank you. Uh, Rachel? So I'll echo some of the themes that, that uh, Sarang was talking about um, in terms of institutions. Um, I think ASEAN also has a challenge to have an institutional governance framework in which to address some of the challenges like the one we talked about in the South China Sea, like one that we didn't explore uh, with the shared waters of the Mekong, uh, which winds its way through uh, 11 countries. Um, that doesn't has a Mekong Regulatory right Commission, but it doesn't have actually a governance mechanism that involves everyone, including China. Um, and we'll need to have more robust governance mechanisms. I think we're going to see the rise of data diplomacy. We're already seeing this, at least in, in the Mekong case, um, where there is there was a, a big drought in, in 2019, a, a dearth of water, so that fish stocks were down 80 to 90 percent. There was there was transport became a problem. Um, and the US State Department hired a company called Eyes on Earth to do a study. And it, it seemed that the 126 million metric meters, uh, meters cubed that was missing from the river um, could be, was a, was a very similar number to the amount that was being retained by Chinese dams upstream. Now, I don't need to always point the finger at China because everybody's building dams on these rivers, and the dams themselves are responsible for hydropower because of climate change. So there really needs to be a better system for tracking, you know, having sort of a, a single point of truth in terms of, of what's going on um, on the ground in terms of resource sharing, 
and then governance mechanisms so that the issues can be worked through in a manner that's timely enough to, to you know, to, to serve the needs of people real time, not three years later. Um, so I think those are two of the major challenges. For militaries, um, I, I think we, we would really like to see the regional militaries incorporating climate change into their everything they do, their planning, their doctrine, their training, their equipment. Um, yes, humanitarian assistance and disaster response, but but that's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Really also trying to anticipate what ethnic or other local, regional, or interstate tensions could uh, have climate change as a spark and to really prepare for that. And to, as, as happens in, in the US and some of the Western countries, have the military be an advocate for better resilience and better planning prior to these things happening rather than having to just sort of try to jump in and save the day afterwards. Um, and then from an energy policy perspective, you know, energy policy makers have historically not necessarily communicated across, across organizational silos in terms of, of meeting their targets, but that needs to be done in a more holistic manner um, if we're going to have um, a stable and workable system given the climate impacts, which, which we're now much better at predicting. You know, we, we know it's gonna happen from a climate perspective. But human beings are sometimes less less uh, predictable than the climate. So now we got to work on, on the human systems that are going to respond. Right, interesting. Now, um, I know that you both have been very generous with your time. Uh, we have uh, maybe just a few minutes left. Uh, I'm wondering if I could just get your reactions at this stage more generally to the climate change challenge for the world. Uh, given recent developments. We've seen, as I've mentioned, Biden administration um, uh, determining that or uh, being clear that climate change is a national security priority, the recommitment of the United States to the Paris Agreement. We've seen the John Kerry Xi Jinping uh, meeting on, uh, in Shanghai on US-China cooperation uh, and trying to essentially find that lane for cooperation, even though there might be a lane for competition and a lane for confrontation in the US-China relationship. And then of course, uh, the Earth Day summit that was uh, at the end of last week, uh, where we saw uh, uh, some countries really, uh, particularly the United States and, and, and others, uh, uh, anteing, uh, upping the ante as it were. Uh, for their uh, commitments on, on the climate. Well, what, what's your reaction in terms of where we are now in sort of this global effort, if one can actually call it a global effort to deal with climate change? Are you more optimistic now or are you feeling, what, what is your general reaction to recent events? Saran. Well, I think we have to be optimistic, right? Because uh, pessimism doesn't get you anywhere. But the challenge cannot be understated. Uh, the, the fact is that we are on track to, uh, at this time, to 1.5. Well, we are really on track. If we do nothing, so we, if we just let business as usual continue with the Paris commitments as the last commitments, we will get to more than three Celsius heating uh, by later in the century. And that's just, just uh, tremendously destructive. I mean, I think there's a consensus that anything about really 1.5 Celsius is far too damaging for the planet. And the question is, can we get to 1.5 Celsius? Now, here's where President Biden and his team, because not just him, but a whole bunch of very able people that surround him, uh, have, I think, made a pretty good start, given that we have lost some time in the US uh, in the last few years. And the commitment to cut uh, domestically emissions 50% below 2005 levels by 2030 represents roughly the pathway of getting to 1.5 Celsius from the standpoint of the US. Now, the question is if the US can do it, and indeed the other countries in the world, uh, EU, India, and China being the other three of the big four, can do similar things. Uh, keeping in mind their historical contributions and conditions. Right. And the question is still an open one. I think the transformations required, the challenges now are less and less those of economics, especially in the electricity and the transport side increasingly. 
but more of politics and governance because the the we, we see the costs for renewable energy falling quite steeply in electricity in transport i think that dynamic is underway although that's going to take a little bit longer but uh the, the challenges are political challenges are those of doing the sorts of collective action things at the national level such as building out grid uh or building out charging stations for example in transport uh, doing the sorts of things in innovation that we need for breakthroughs in industry, in long range transport like aviation and shipping. So here's where national and international action is essential because local action, although really important, cannot take us there. Uh, this is about conflict of interest. It's about lobbies. It's about uh, local versus state versus federal types of tensions. And I think it's going to take a, a very major political and, and global governance effort to get us to 1.5 Celsius, which is looking very tough, but still just about doable. And certainly 2 Celsius, which is also very challenging, but uh, still doable. So that's the challenge. The question is, can the nations and the U.S. included meet it? Great, thank you. Now, Sarang, I know that you might have to leave. So if you do leave, don't feel bad about it. Just uh, but stay as long as you can. Uh, Rachel, your thoughts? And uh, um... So just to build on what Sarang has talked about, um, countries could be forgiven for having political whiplash about the US leadership on climate. Um, and But I think we need to sort of get past that um, and have a moment of focus, because this is less about competition, as you mentioned, and, and really more about a race against time. And so the governance structures need to be in place, um, the, the incentives need to be in place, um, and then there needs to be a lot of innovation deployed really quickly. And I think what's the positive news is that the the, the corporate corporates around the world are moving forward, um, the, the banks are now demanding uh, higher scrutiny and, and better returns um, and more you know, basically making commitments only to invest in, in, in more climate secure, climate smart uh, investments. Um, I think it's gonna be up to countries to sort of get their grids hydrogen ready and, and, and deploy hydrogen technologies as quickly as they come out because it's gonna be a big part of the answer across major industries. Um, from a military perspective, it's it's both how can you do your ramped up job um, of, of saving people while at the same time using the gravitas of, of the military voice in, in legislative and executive processes to try to urge this on. Um, and in countries that are like the U.S. able to invest in military technologies, how can military investments actually help to propel forward some of these technologies um, with, with obvious benefits to both you know, military installations, but, but civilian economies. Um, so there really needs to be a much more holistic approach. It's, you're starting to see it happen, but it's just hard to manage such a multi-headed beast, even within one government, <laughs> and now we're talking right. about global governance. So maybe we should turn the question to you, Al. You're, you're the global governance guy. <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. I'm not the one uh, answering the questions here. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to dodge that one. Um, anyway, um, we've really gone over time. You've been both very generous. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you very much. I commend uh, uh, Rachel Sarang and their colleagues' article on Asia Global Online. Please uh, follow Asia Global Online. Come to our website. Come to the Asia Global Institute website. Sign up for uh, to get our news and information by email. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. You guys know the drill. And thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Sarang, for joining us. You've been very generous with your time and very insightful. And maybe I feel a little bit better uh, about things at this point. But, you know, I mean, these things come and go, I suppose. But um, right now, maybe there's some hope after, after the Earth Day. Uh, we yeah. should uh, feel a little bit better uh, and, and take in the heat and uh, lower our air conditioners. Uh, right. so. Momentum forward. Great. Right. Good speaking to you today. <laughs> so thank you guys. <laughs>